So this magma only glows um, very, very slightly at night. So it's erupting at a temperature of about 500 degrees. Normally magma is about 1,000 degrees. And when you've went, so sodium carbonate is a bit like washing soda. Not that anyone uses washing soda anymore. But when the lava flows have erupted, but then they soak up water from the atmosphere and that changes their color from black to white. Now, as I said, most of the volcanoes, most of the volcanic activity on Earth actually happens under the sea, so you never get a chance to visit it. But there's one place, which is in here in Africa, where you can actually watch. the birth of a new ocean. So I'm just going to show a quick um, picture. So in Africa, there's, a, um, there's a, a, a join between three of the tectonic plates. And this join is slowly pulling apart along the Red Sea, pulling apart along the Gulf of Aden, and pulling apart down the main <coughs> Ethiopian rift. So in 40 million years' time, 40 million years' time, there will be a new ocean in that part of Africa. At the moment, there's no ocean there, but you can actually see the formation of what will be the new ocean floor. Um, it's difficult to get to, but rather than using ships, we can use um, helicopters. And taking these helicopters, we can actually, actually fly out across the plate boundary. So these are all young lava flows, which have erupted over the last few hundred or thousand years. And these big fractures here are forming because the plates are pulling apart. So these are the ruptures that are forming as the plates move. There was a, another episode of plate movement in, in 2005. So this fracture moved three meters vertically and two meters sideways in the space of a couple of days. There was a volcanic eruption, a small volcanic eruption associated with the opening of one of these fractures. So this is just, just off the edge of the volcano. And again, we can look at the microscopic materials coming out of the volcano to work out um, what was driving the eruption. This region is so remote that, in fact, the, all of the volcanic eruptions of the last five years have been detected first by satellite uh, rather than by humans. This is a fresh lava flow from, uh, I think this is from August 2007. You can just about make out a slightly different color because the lava flow hasn't got weathered yet. And again, if we collect fresh samples of this material, that then gives us the mineral clues to where the magma came from. Now this part of the rift, we've had a big experiment running for the last few years. And this is this cartoon. Um, and we'll now take you on a um, on a journey using, so we've used, we've got as if we're in an aircraft flying over the rift. So this is now looking, this is the rift valley here. This is the volcano at the top of the rift. And these, this is actually um, imagery that we've collected from an air, aerial, uh, from an aircraft. It's slightly exaggerated, so things are a little bit steeper than they actually look like. But this is actually flying along, a, along the rift valley as if it was a mid oceanic ridge up towards the central volcano at the top. Now we're going to spin round and take a look at the inside of the Earth. So you can see how deep the, the rift is. These are gaps in the, these spiky bits are gaps in the data rather than anything real. So we're now looking at the lava flows that have come off a large volcano at the, at the end of the rift. You can see the shapes of those lava flows just here. These lava flows are just a few thousand years old. So as well as measuring this, the shape of the surface of the Earth, we've also been monitoring earthquakes, and we've now we're now draping some colour over the top of the surface there. So if you look at the colour, that picks out where the active parts of the rift are. Now this is a cross section which is going down to about 40 or 50 kilometres. And we've, we, we can map out areas that are hot and areas that are cold. The areas that are hot are the areas where we think that magma is being stored, which is about to erupt. And all the way along that rift, we've got pockets of 
magma. And every time the riff moves, we get a, a stream of earthquakes stretching from the surface down to about 10 kilometers deep. So we're now flying under the rift valley through the locations of those earthquakes. And the, the, so the rift valley is just above us. This is the molten rock that's 40 kilometers deep. And that's, that's the fissure that's now about 10 kilometers long, sorry, 10 kilometers deep and 60 kilometers long. That's the fissure that the magma is moving along as the plate boundaries split, split apart. So here's the, the line of earthquakes mapping up into the base of the rift. So this is the one place on Earth other than Iceland where you can actually um, walk over a plate boundary where the plates are actually pulling apart and you can actually measure what's going on inside. Of course, the question that everyone wants to know is um, when's the next supervolcano eruption or when's the next eruption going to happen? And in fact, one of the challenges with, challenges with geology is that um, we've only seen tiny eruptions compared to eruptions that have happened in the past. The eruption of um, Pinatubo in 1991 was about, it involved about five cubic kilometers of molten rock. The largest eruptions uh, known from the past have involved as much as um, a thousand times that volume. And the only way you can reconstruct those eruptions is by going into the field, finding the traces of those deposits, looking at them under the microscope. And this deposit here, this, is, this section is about two meters deep. It's made of very, very fine volcanic ash. That it's so fine it feels like flour. This is a location in southern India. This, was, this deposit formed 75,000 years ago following the eruption of a uh, volcano 3,000 kilometers away from this sort of source, uh, a place called Tuba. And that's the largest known eruption of the last 100,000 years. Fortunately, eruptions like Toba are actually very rare. Probably, but, um, I mean, there's only a 90, there's, a, there's only a 1% chance that a, the next, another er, an eruption of that size will happen within the next 8,000 years. Um, and so, what we have to do is, in terms of, in terms of trying to understand the signals that we're going to see before the eruptions, actually look at those deposits. Uh, so, this is an example. This is a, a grain of a mineral called quartz, SiO2 from a, um, a New Zealand deposit that involved over 1,500 cubic kilometers of magma. You can see it's broken apart, it broke apart during the eruption, and it's actually got little holes in it that are filled with uh, glass from the, um, which, was a, which was the molten material in the magma chamber before the eruption. Of course, to understand the impact of these very largest eruptions, you need to look at tiny samples and to look at tiny samples, you need enormous pieces of equipment. This is just an example. This is Naomi, who just finished, a, um, finished st her studies on this particular volcano. And she's looked at how the chemical um, the trace um, constituents inside the quartz grains vary across this mineral using the diamond light source synchrotron, which is just down the road. And the thing what you can, you can see in all of these is that there's this change from a dark color to a bright color just before the edge of those quartz crystals. So these crystals were, were growing, they then stopped growing, something changed in the magma system, they grew rapidly but under different conditions, and then the eruption happened. So you know that these volcanoes usually get between 10 and 100 years warning before the eruption. We just don't know how useful that sort of warning is going to be before it actually happens. We're, much, uh, we're in a much better state in terms of understanding Volcanoes that erupt continuously. This is Tungurawa in Ecuador, which has been erupting since 1999. And for those volcanoes with monitoring equipment, we can actually be uh, much more certain about what's going to happen next. Well, I hope I've given you a bit of a visual tour of volcanic activity. I'd be very happy to answer any questions if you have some. And um, thank you very much. So, the, so there's two, two different ways that ash forms. So one is in a volcano, in a 
molten rock that contains a lot of dissolved gas. Um, when you release the pressure, so at the start of an eruption, and the magma rises towards the surface, the gas forms bubbles, and the bubbles then grow. And if they grow quickly enough, they're actually the magma breaks up. And so that's the same way as with the Mentos experiments, the way that, that you know, the, the liquid that's inside gets turned into a spray. So that's effectively the way that most ash forms. The other way that ash forms is, I see why, when hot magma comes into contact with something cold and wet, particularly water, so there's basically the, the water then converts into steam, but the magma shatters. Um, so it's a bit like if you drop, I don't know you have this case, if you take molten toffee and drop it into water, you probably get something similar. It quenches very quickly and it's very, very, very brittle. And so you can tell the difference between those sorts, those sorts of ash, because in the one case the ash is full of bubbles, and in the other case the ash is just blocky. So the, um, yes, Lanzarote is a fantastic place because you can actually, as you say, you can pick up lava flows which have got, where, where the, the lava's black and then you've got these blocks of bright green um, olivine rich rock in them. So in fact, olivine is the main constituent of the Earth's interior. Once you get below about 100 kilometers, once you get into the mantle, sorry, once you get below 10 kilometers in the ocean, once you get into the mantle, olivine is the main constituent of the, of the Earth's mantle. So those olivine rich rocks are actually samples of the mantle to be brought up accidentally by the flow of lava towards the surface. So there's loads of that? Um, Lots, yes. And what, what's the chemical to make of it? So olivine is magnesium silicate. It's, um, so the olivine in Lanzarote would be about 90% magnesium silicate, 10% iron silicate. Yes. Under what conditions do the Exactly on column of the giant core zone and the stuff that produced. So the it looks as though I think in um, most magma, most magmatic systems, um, if they cool under the right conditions, then you can form um, hexagonal or pentagonal joints. So they're just they're just cooling joints. But the places they're best developed are. Um, so in fact, in Ethiopia you can find they form actually within the interiors of lava flows, just a few centimetres below the surface, uh, covering of the lava. So they can form under air in some conditions, some circumstances. And they're very common in lava flows that have been erupted under water or under ice. So if you go to Iceland, you'll see spectacular um, development of these sorts of joints. But it's just it's just um, cooling and contraction. So, so I think it's relatively fast cooling. Um, I think so. You can reproduce the experiment. People have done laboratory experiments using various <coughs> mixtures of water and starch. And so on. But it's basically because as the magma is cooling, there's a slight change in volume, and, and so it contracts, and the columns tend to form. The columns tend to point towards the surface where the heat's escaping. Okay, right, well thank you very much. So I say there's plenty of materials, some of which I've talked about in the talk, which are out in the atrium. Do go and pick them up and uh, help yourselves. Okay, thank you. Thank you.